belongs to us, the people, and the, and the land. Now, the statute law is the law that is passed in Parliament via our supposed representatives. So what happens is the House of Commons will have a debate about the issue. They'll agree on various things, send it to the House of Lords, they'll have a debate. And between them, they'll come up with a, a, a bill for a proposed Act of Parliament, which must be consented to by both houses on behalf of the people. And then it goes to a monarch who, on behalf of the imperial crown of the realm, consents to the Act. And therefore, you have the monarch, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, duly representing all of us. That's the theory so that we have laws that are passed, consented to by all of us. Those are our statute laws. And in addition to that, we have God's laws, because in this country, we are a, officially a Christian nation. And again, we have been on record since the Edict of Thessalonica, issued by the Western Roman emperors. And at that time, which was about 380 AD or 385 AD, I can never remember which one, um, the Edict of Thessalonica decreed that all of the Western Roman Empire was now officially Christian, okay? Now that's all recognized in our coronation oath and various other um, pieces of law that we have, including the Magna Carta. Now, what I want to talk about with the common law is people's misunderstanding, not only about where common law comes from, but also about such documents as the Magna Carta, because there's so much nonsense going around about it. So hopefully I can set the record straight. Now the first thing, as I say, is that in this jurisdiction, our laws come from God. That is the constitutional position, it's the legal position. Whether you personally believe in God or not is entirely up to you. And you can believe whatever you like inside your own head and you can talk about it, etc. But the laws and the constitution in this country are God's, okay? So that's irrefutable, you can't argue about it. Now what that, does, what that means is that we look to the Old and the New Testament for our laws. So for example, Exodus chapter 20 verse 13 states, thou shalt not kill. How many of you know that law? Presumably all of you. Whereas how many of you know the Offences Against the Person Act, 1861? <laughs> right? <laughs> now, thou shalt not kill is a pretty broad order. So helpfully, the common law and the statute law and the case law, etc., fill in the details, uh, quite macabrely, about all the different ways that you can go around killing each other. You know, suffocating each other, blowing each other up, poisoning each other, beating each other up, etc., right? So, Whilst thou shalt not kill does not provide that detail, we can look at the Offences Against the Person Act and we can look at various case law to try and understand a particular situation, okay? Now, where Magna Carta comes in is the idea that we have ancient rights and liberties and usages and customs in this realm. Now, those actually... Hello? Oh, sorry. Those actually come from God. So in, under God's law, we're all equal in his eyes. Nobody's above anybody else. We're all subject to his laws. And nobody is above the law. And incidentally, not even the monarch is above the law because the law makes the king or the queen. So the king and queen is subject to the law, the same as the members of the parliament, the same as every single one of us in this society we are all subject to it, okay? So what that means is if there's a conflict with our man-made laws and God's laws, God's laws win. Because what God's laws say is, you don't detract from my laws and you don't add to them, okay? Now that's very important because when you look at our documents that existed on record before the Houses of Parliament came into being, then usually what happened was that the king would make a new law. And what happened in, typically was that when the king or the queen came to the throne, they usually had to do a bit of a bargaining position with the, uh, bit of a bargaining job with the people because ultimately the crown accepts 
the realm, the rights, the privileges, the property, etc., in exchange for a vow to the people, a solemn oath to the people to govern us according to our laws. Okay? So that's why it's so important for the monarch them themselves to be subject to the law because they have to uphold it. Now what happened was that every, at every coronation, the king or queen typically would issue, issue a coronation charter, their promise to the people about how they were going to, to um, reign. Now in, char in um, 1100, Henry I issued the coronation of liberty, uh, sorry, the Charter of Liberties as his coronation oath. Now that Charter of Liberties binds all future monarchs, so it still binds our current majesty. And that was also referred to in the Magna Carta, because what happened was that despite issuing the Charter of Liberties to us, subsequent monarchs broke that charter. And so the barons took King John the first to a negotiation at Runnymede and showed him the Charter of Liberties and insisted as an heir to the throne that he was bound by this charter. And then they added a few more clauses and that became known as the Magna Carta 1215. Now the problem with the Magna Carta 1215 was that it was never committed to the statute books because the Pope set it aside 10 weeks later. So there's a whole load of reasons and I won't bore you with that. But then the king died in 1216. So the new king, they issued another Magna Carta, but the regent had to do it because obviously the king was still, um, he was too young at that time. So the Magna Carta 1216 was issued. Then the Charter of the Forest 1217 was issued, governing how the forest people and uh, property should be dealt with. But then when he came to the throne in 1225, he issued the Magna Carta again under his great seal, but it wasn't committed to the statute book. Statutes were still very unusual at that time. But in 1297, when King Edward came to the throne, he was shown the Charter of Liberties and made to give the Magna Carta 1297. If you read the introduction, it says that the king accepts that he's read the Charter of Liberties 1100, he accepts that he's bound by it, and then there are a few more clauses added. Now, Chapter 9 of the Magna Carta is still binding statute law. So whilst it's also part of our common law, you don't need to have that argument because it's on the statute books, www.legislation.gov.uk. Chapter 9 grants the right and freedoms to the city of London, to the ports, to other cities and to other boroughs. Okay, so that grants the um, liberties to the place. Chapter 29 grants the liberties to us, we the people. And I'm going to read it out to you because again, this is still current statute law. Hold on a minute please. Find it. Right. Chapter 29. This is current UK statute law. No free man, of course that includes women and children as well, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his freehold, liberties, free customs, outlawed, exiled or in any other wise destroyed. Right? So that covers pretty much everything. The an in any otherwise destroyed is what us lawyers do where it's a catch-all phrase where we can't think of all the different ways in which someone might be destroyed. So we just put in, in any other way. Now that's important because when it comes to what's happening at the moment, people are being destroyed in various ver different ways, okay? So even if they're not being outlawed or exiled, or they haven't ha yet had their freehold property taken away from them, etc. We've all had our liberties taken away from us. We've, some of us have been taken and put into prison and put into psychiatric hospitals. Some of us have been actually um, imprisoned in jail as opposed to just being in a psychiatric hospital. Many people have been quarantined beyond their will. Okay, and unfortunately many people have now lost their freeholds because of the economic crisis. Okay. And of course, when it comes to being outlawed, whilst people haven't been officially outlawed as such, if you're not vaccinated, essentially what they're trying to do is create an outlaw of all those who 
won't comply. Okay? So then it goes on to say, in the general saving clause, now what in, in law, what a general saving clause is, again, is it's a catch-all. That if people don't understand all the rest of the law, or they think that this law might change any other law, etc., we try and clarify it in what's called a general saving provision. And it says this, and all these customs and liberties aforesaid, which we have granted to be holden within this realm, as much as appertaineth to us and our heirs, we shall observe. No, they don't say we might observe it, or we'll think about observing it. We shall observe. And all men of this realm, as well spiritual and temporal, shall observe the same against all persons likewise. And then he goes on for a further promise. We, nor our heirs, shall procure or do anything whereby the liberties in this charter contained shall be infringed or broken. And then here's the final point. And if anything be procured by any person, contrary to the premises, it shall be had of no if force nor effect. So in other words, if any laws are passed that breach the Magna Carta 1217, chapter 29, according to the, the king's own promise, binding on all the heirs and successors of the throne, it shall be had of no force and of no effect. Right? So things like the Coronavirus Act 2020, when it takes away your liberties, according to the Magna Carta, it shall be void and have no effect. But how many of you knew that? None of you. And do you know why? Because you're not taught law at school. You haven't been taught law at school for generations. And that evidence is that that's the same for countries around the world. So we have a situation where even our fundamental law, and I've just read you that, that's chapter 29, it's not long, is it? And it might be in Old English, but if you study it, it's not difficult. And yet how many citizens in this land even know that this exists? When the Magna Carta was first published, it was sent out to everyone in the land on the king's orders. Because if you're the monarch and you've sworn an oath to uphold the law, you want your people to uphold the law. And so it was sent out to everyone and people used to carry it around in their pockets. Well, you lucky folks have got printers, or if you can't, you can go to the library or whatever, ask a friend. You go on to www.legislation.gov.uk, print it off, carry it with you. Pull it out when people want to breach your liberties. Pull it out, show them, and ask them what legal right they're claiming to derogate from your fundamental rights. Okay? That's very, very important. Do you feel empowered by that? Good. Good. Right, so then just to, or you, but to explain a bit more, what happened after the Magna Carta was a certain amount of lull. But then when it came to 1627, Charles I, he started breaking the Magna Carta. So the Houses of Commons got together and they listed all the breaches of our law that were occurring at the time. They put it to a vote and agreed that all of those breaches were happening. They then handed it over to the House of Lords, who also agreed that all those breaches were happening. And they took a vote to issue a petition of right. Okay? It's on the statute books, the Petition of Right, 1628. If you read it, it sets out all the similar kind of laws that are being broken today. And so what we the people did was we issued that to the monarch and we said, these are our rights. We're petitioning you to uphold your oath and to uphold our laws. And the king responded by saying, so, so be it. He then abolished parliament for 11 years. That was his kickback. So for 11 years, the government, the, um, this country wasn't governed. People couldn't go to church. People couldn't take the sacraments, etc. They weren't represented. So eventually in 1642, civil war broke out. And unfortunately for the king, he lost. And he was then brought to trial. Now, I've recently been scrutinizing that trial. And I will tell you now, controversial as this sounds, our monarch did not have a fair trial. I am not a fan of Charles I, but he did not have a fair trial. The House of Commons did not have jurisdiction to bring him to trial, which they did. 
They refuse to get, let him have representation. And the worst part of it all is this. Under our law, you can only be judged by your peers. Nobody in the House of Commons was a monarch. And King Charles I protested that and said, how can I be judged by any of you? And I don't think he used the words with, with, with respect. But you'd have hoped he'd said, with respect, you don't do my job. You have absolutely no idea what it's like to try and run a country. And those were the um, submissions he made, but he was ignored. He was found guilty of treason and he was beheaded. Now later, the people who took that decision were prosecuted and found guilty of regicide. And in fact, Cromwell's body was exhumed and his head stuck on a, uh, you know, thing for everyone to see, etc. So that didn't well, go well for everybody either. So what happened was that we then lost the king and we became a republic for a certain amount of years. But actually we found that we needed a king, apparently, according to the history books. So we invited James the First, uh, Charles I's son, and he came back to the realm. Now it still didn't go too well, because when James II came to the throne, he started breaking the, the law again. So we had another civil uh, war and another set of problems. And what happened was that in 1688, the Houses of Commons and the Houses of Lords invited William of Orange and his wife, Mary, to come to England to invade England to take the throne. Except apparently it wasn't an invasion because apparently we invited them in. But they came in and we said to them, well, before we hand over the throne to you, you know what, we're fed up with this long line of monarchs who keep breaking our laws. So before you ascend to the throne, you've got to agree to another charter of rights, the Bill of Rights. And so the Bill of Rights 1688, stroke 89, because it wasn't consented to until they came to the throne the following year, but the 1688-89 Bill of Rights is still current statute law. Okay, and that Bill of Rights was the founding fathers of the American Constitution. That's what they referred to, as well as the Magna Carta. It's a fundamental piece of our human rights legislation and our Constitution. And what the Bill of Rights says in the section called Subjects' Rights is once again that we have ancient rights and liberties which must be upheld. And the point about that is that no monarch grants or takes away these rights. That's why the term ancient rights is there and that's why you see them in all these documents throughout history. So when you come to the modern day state of affairs, we've got the Human Rights Act 1998 and the Human Rights Act enshrines the European Declaration of Human Rights 1950 which enshrines the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948. And the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights arose out of the horrors of the war, both wars actually, where the lawyers realized that the existing framework didn't cover all eventualities, including giving medical treatment, experimenting on people without consent. Because at the end of the war, when they looked at who had committed what atrocities against whom. Do you know who the main leadership of the Nazi party consisted of? Which profession? Who said it? Who said the doctors? The doctors. The doctors, more doctors were members of the Nazi party than any other profession. And what happened was that the doctors were conducting medical treatment and experimentation on prisoners of war and internees without their consent freely informed and freely fully informed rather and freely given so at the end of the at the end of the war a number of doctors were brought to trial in a famous case called Carl Brandt okay he was the main doctor USA versus Carl Brandt and they're collectively called the medical cases and on page 182 i think it is off the top of my head there's a section called Permissible Medical Experiments. Now, the important thing about that is this. At that point in time, as you've just read, at least for the Brits, there was already existing human rights that you couldn't kill someone and you couldn't destroy them. Okay, And other countries had similar laws. But there was also an international code of medical ethics 
in place at that time, which doctors who were called upon to advise the judges at the Nuremberg trial set out for the public so that people already knew that at that point in time, in 1946, when the trial started, there was already permissible medical experimentation and not and prohibited, right? So the permissible medical experimentation lists 10 principles. Those principles became the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code is binding international criminal law. For anyone who says the Nuremberg Code doesn't apply, they are talking nonsense. It's binding international criminal law, it's binding international medical ethics, and indeed it essentially enshrines the position about offences against the Person Act and about, you know, common law murder, etc. So yes, it absolutely exists. So the point about all of that, folks, is that you have all of those rights, God's laws, common law, documents like the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, human rights, all of those protect you. But the only way you're going to know that you have all these protections is for you to read these laws. They're not actually that difficult. Honestly, I know it's easy for me to say that. But honestly, they're really not because they were written for the average person to be able to understand. Okay? So what you all need to do is read the Magna Carta, read the Bill of Rights, read the Human Rights Act, read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, read the European Charter of Human Rights, read the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and most importantly, recently, the Human Rights and Bioethics, 2005. Okay? You do some home reading. Once you read those laws, you will never allow yourself to be masked or tested or injected or given treatment or denied your rights and liberties ever again. Are you on it? Yeah. <laughs> will you please tell other people to get on it? Yeah. Because at the moment, we are living in a Mad Max society. For those of you who've seen that film, Mad Max, it was a completely lawless society. If we don't know the law, who is going to uphold it? There are 168,000 lawyers in this country. There are 68 million people. I'm not a mathematician, but somebody else told me that's one in 500 of us are lawyers. Right? How many of you heard, have how many of you have heard speaking out? Of those 168,000 lawyers in this country, how many of you heard speak out? Do you know why? Because a lot of those lawyers don't know these laws either. They're not taught about them at law school, right? So an awful lot of lawyers don't even know this stuff. When I've asked both soldiers, because I'm a soldier as well, and lawyers, who has read the Geneva Convention, nobody I've spoken to has read it. Exactly. Not a single person. The law of armed conflict is contained in the Ministry of Defence's manual, right? And the foreword by the Chief of General Staff specifically says that that's the UK's understanding and interpretation of the law. Now, if you go to Chapter 7, which deals with the wounded, dead and medical services, Chapter Paragraph 7.5 specifically says that you cannot give medical treatment or experiment on someone without their freely informed consent. It also specifically says that everyone has the right to refuse treatment. It also specifically says that these are prohibited acts of unlawful warfare. Right? And finally, it says you cannot renunciate your rights. And criminal law says that. You cannot consent to being grievously bodily harmed or murdered. Right? You can't consent. The law won't allow you to consent. Funnily enough, you're all precious, okay? So I've gone on for quite a long time now, but basically, guys, what we need to do is reinstate law at school so that by the time people leave at 16 or 18, they have a fundamental grasp of the absolute fundamentals of law. For example, non-discrimination. For example, medical apartheid is against the law. For example, you can't go about sticking a needle in someone's arm containing a hundred of undisclosed ingredients. Okay? So we need to learn the law. People who are weaponized, such as soldiers, the police, the uh, medical profession, right? They need to have a certificate. 
before they're allowed to practice. They need to pass an exam, ed, ed, you know, examining them and their basic understanding of the law. Informed consent for doctors is an absolute critical must going forward. Okay, um, and finally, in terms of all the deaths that are happening, you all have a constitutional, legal, lawful, ethical, and moral duty. In other words, this is not an option. Your duty is to report to the coroner and to the police any suspicious circumstances or evidence that you might have relating to someone's death. Okay, and the authority for that is the Harold Shipman inquiry where the, the, the inquiry said that most people don't know the law, so they don't know their common law duty to report these matters to the coroner and to the police. So again, I remind you, withholding evidence and information is then a colluding with a crime, okay? So the final thing I wanted to tell you is that the lawyers all around the world have been launching and running and winning various legal cases. Yay. The Americans for doctors, frontline doctors. Yay. I haven't. I'm not going to take any credit for it. I do this bit. But the American frontline doctors, they've just um, successfully sued the um, CDC and uh, the, the court said, yes, it was all un unlawful and unconstitutional, right? So that's going to set a massive domino effect because we know that it was unlawful and unconstitutional. So anybody who's taken part in these measures, the architect or advertising it or marketing it or um, coercing people, unfortunately, they are all now suspects in a live criminal investigation because these court, or these court decisions that are coming out around the world are that these measures have been unconstitutional. I just read you our constitution. They're unlawful, again, same thing. So please, people, have, bear, bear, you know, do stand strong and hold the line because whilst we might not win every single law case, there are enough cases going on around the world that there will be some that win. And when they win on the points, it's the same arguments and the same evidence that's applying throughout all the... So have hope. Um, and finally, what we need you all to do is understand that the pandemic treaty the WHO Pandemic Treaty is a massive threat to our Constitution because what the WHO wants is complete authority to make any laws that they like in relation to our public health when the next pandemic is declared. <laughs> now the submissions I made was that you have no power and law we call it ultra-virus. You're acting ultra-virus, your power. If you think any foreign body such as the WEF, the World Economic Forum, the WHO, anybody, frankly, can come into Britain, our proud nation, our proud independent sovereign nation, and start dictating to us how we're going to live, okay? In our laws, that's potentially treason. If you allow a foreign body, a foreign power, to come into our country and take over and start making laws, etc., that is potentially treasonous. Let's be very clear about that. Right, so what we need to do, those of us who are aware of this, is tell everybody that they've got to now be writing to their MPs, educating and telling everybody we've, not, we've got to make a massive pushback on this. People around the world have told us that they've looked to Britain, I know loads of people country. We're in Canada and they're looking to us. We're in America and they're looking to us. We're in Britain, right? So in Britain, they're looking to us for several reasons. One is that a lot of their constitutions come from us, right? So we are the original nation that produced a lot of these laws that they're relying on us to uphold and to, to, you know, to own and to show the rest of the world how we have these laws and how we will own them and how we will up, assert them, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, to actually, you know, start educating the next generation about how they're going to uphold all of this because a lot of the people that I'm speaking to in their 20s really have started to understand something serious is happening but they don't have enough older mentors to help them understand. Now, they're the next generation, so when I pop my clogs, you know, it's going to be up to everyone else, right? The younger ones. So we need to disseminate this as much as possible. Um, 
Finally, people say to me, how are we going to get justice when the courts are so compromised? Yeah. Well, you are the jury, every single one of you, and every single one of you is the judge. This is the court of public opinion. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are in court the whole time that we are debating this with our legal issues, with our evidence, with our analysis. We are sharing it amongst each other and gradually people are understanding what's going on. Ultimately, you can put the decision in the hands of a couple of judges or you can put it into all of your hands. And the power lies with you and the sovereignty lies with you, okay? The last thing for those of you who don't understand the constitutional position, those people, the members of parliament, they are public servants. It's in the name. They are our servants. We pay their wages. They represent us. We have to consent what it is they're doing. If they don't have our consent, it's not lawful. Okay? So less of this, please, cowering behind these Simon Says politicians and more getting on their backs and demanding that they do their job as our servant. Amen. What we have is a servant's uprising where they're thinking we are the servants and they're the masters. They've got it totally wrong. Okay? We are not subjects. When we are not numbers. And our coronation oath says that the monarch will govern us. She doesn't rule us. She governs us in accordance with our laws. Okay. So I'll finish there, everybody. But I hope that really helps you understand stuff.